We're aboard the SS Milwaukee Clipper in Muskegon, Michigan. It's 12.30 a.m. and we have a lifeboat next to us, lifeboat number three. And we are going to go through the process of preparing the boat, swinging it out, and imagining ourselves lowering it. Then we're going to swing it back in just to get a good understanding of how these mechanisms worked. And these are some of the same mechanisms that you would find on many of the classic ocean liners of the turn of the century. And here we have a set of Welland davits. Ships like the Olympic class were outfitted in these, although these are a later model and a slight variant. On the Olympic class, they had double action Welland davits where the davits would swing out, launch a boat, and swing back in and pick up a second row of boats. Of course, those rows of boats weren't there. But these are single action, meaning there's only ever one boat on this set of davits. Single action davits like these are the same model as what were aboard the HMHS Britannic in 1914. These are a little later. These were built in 1940, 1941, but they are Welland davits. Now, interestingly, these Welland davits were made in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. In the early morning of April 15, 1912, the boats on the sinking Titanic were swung out to begin the evacuation. It took Titanic's deck crew of dozens of sailors around a half hour to get the ship's 16 boat stations prepared for lowering. There were some struggles along the way, but it was generally well executed. A boat drill was supposed to be conducted at sea the morning of the 14th, but it was canceled due to weather. It's occasionally said that this left Titanic's crew ill-prepared, but there was an often forgotten boat drill conducted while Titanic was in Southampton on the day of its departure. Two boats were swung out, lowered into the water, and rowed around the basin for a bit before the boats were brought back up. There's a full documentary on Titanic's Southampton boat drill being published on the Steam and Splendor Network in collaboration with this video. The link for that is in the description below. This exercise will give us hands-on knowledge on what Titanic's crew went through and why they may have encountered the errors that they did. First things first, we're gonna lift these railings off. Aside from uncovering and stocking the boats with survival gear, we're doing every step of the lifeboat swing out process. Next we have to undo the keel locks there. So there's one on each side. Release the tie downs! Next you crank the boat up. Alright, start cranking up. Levi lifts the brake on the winch and Barrett begins cranking, lifting the boat slowly off the chocks. That should be good. All right, drop the brake. The winch has an electric motor that can be attached to do this job automatically, but to better simulate 1912 technology, we're doing this by hand and skipping the motor. Now take that key and start cranking it out. All right, set it to the bigger pulley. Yeah. See how the pulleys are labeled out and in? The out and in. Yeah. Put the pulley on the bigger one that says out. Okay. And you're cranking it clockwise. And swing out. There you go. <laughs> we each took a turn cranking to experience how difficult these davits are to move. Slower on four. Granted, these davits are now antiques and not regularly in use, and brand new davits on an operational ship would have been a bit easier. Good speed! Come on, this ship is sinking. Put your backs into it, ladies. We're level. How far out we up there? Slow on out! It took about 70 rotations of the crank to get the boat swung from the center line to the nearly fully out position. Now, to be clear, our team at HFX don't just animate and code all day. We have a firefighter, we have an army veteran, we have a construction worker, and a government contractor. We're mostly in shape. And yet this still was a challenge. Good speed! Get that upper wheel. Reach. Reaching the end of travel. It's getting easier. Yep. Oh, that's fun. Oh, yeah. All right, hold. Hold. It's about as far as they'd want to take it. Yeah, I wouldn't go any more than that. All right. This is probably what we've done, Cash. 
We cranked the davits out far enough that the boat was clear of the side of the ship, but not quite as far as the davits could possibly go. We sort of eyeballed it until the boat was clear enough that in theory it could be lowered. I mentioned this a few years ago in our annual Titanic livestream, but I noticed that the davits in the Titanic wreck were cranked out to varying degrees of extension. Some only swing out a little bit, others were nearly fully out. On different sides of the ship, the boats needed more clearance and others needed less due to the tilt of the vessel. That means that Titanic's crew eyeballed it just like us. You know what's really cool is that all you have to do is pull up that switch to lower it. <laughs> yeah. The plug's not. Don't do it. Actually, don't even joke. That's, that'll be that so much. The break off. That'll be so much work to pull it back in. Gives you a really good idea what it looks like the night Imagine Titanic sank. Like this. Just looking down into this black abyss. And I hope my passengers for not whining enough. More six stories. Yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> do it at night. What? Ninety feet up. <laughs> We're probably only 30 to 40. If we were to proceed, what would the next step be? The next step would most likely be lowering the lifeboat to the deck level. This ladder rung here would allow people to work their way down and into the boat and climbing down before eventually being lowered to the surface of the water. If we were to lower, which we're not going to do, you could do this lever here controls this brake drum here. And we just lift. Yes, this is the only thing stopping that lifeboat from going the 30 so feet down to the water surface. If we lifted that brake, how fast would it lower? Quite. Lift all the way up would probably be near free fall. How do they control the speed? You could also put the crank here, which would be the much more controlled way to very slowly lower it down. Now, I understand it is even more fun to swing it back in. Oh, truly. It's smaller gear. Also something to consider on the early Welland Davits, such as Titanic, they did not have this wonderful dual pulley system. They, were, they had they one on one side. They it in by hand with the ropes. Yep. Right? One on one side, one on the other, and they would have to control the speed for it to lower. This is a much better system than that. Although the davits are still independently controlled, this makes the process of lowering much less jerky and much more concise and smooth. The 50 people these lifeboats were certified to carry for each of the four lifeboats is much smaller than the Clipper's 900 passenger capacity plus the crew. This was augmented by the life rafts that would have been in the area that has now been converted to seating areas on both sides. There were several rafts that would be stacked up in those areas. To reverse the direction of the davits, the crank is removed from the larger out gear and placed onto the smaller in gear. In is clockwise. Okay, so it's clockwise. Both yeah. ways. That makes cool. sense. Get ready to pull in and clockwise rotate. Now we're cranking the davits back to their center line, more or less perfectly vertical. This lines the keel of the boat up with its chocks so that it can be rested back down on its cradle. As the arms come closer back to center, it takes much more work for the lifeboats to move as they're pulling it up due to gravity. Go faster! Holy smokes. And imagine doing this more than once in a night. I'm not doing this and I'm getting tired. Imagine having 20 boats. Oh, and tell me what you think about this. For me, it's very easy. We're paused for a moment while cranking them back in. And I have a really good appreciation for why they skipped boat drills. What do you think? Uh, it's, it's difficult. It's hard, eh? Very certified. Is this difficult because these are these haven't been greased in forever, or would it be about this difficult on a functional ship? A, a mix of both. With a boat this heavy, no matter how many gears and pulleys you have, gravity is still fighting against you 100% of the way. But not being greased in so long definitely does not contribute to the ease that it takes to push these boats in and out. This here was one of the two life 
bolt equipment storage cabins. These Jacobs ladders here, which are the steel ladders, would have been in the boats as well as some of this other equipment, but this is also where they stored the oil, the signage, and if you look back there, a lot of the wrench is used to crank the boats in and out. All right. Ready on right, ready on left. Swinging clockwise, ready, and rotate inward. Push. Good speed. All right, slow on right, slow on right. Slow on right, slow on right. That's you guys. All right, hold, hold, hold. Holding. Bring it in more on left. Bring forward. It on left. Pausing on right. Okay. Barrett, inspect, please. Barrett is checking to make sure that the boat is lined up before we lower it back down onto the chocks. Ready for lowering. Ready for lowering, sir. Lowering. Right. Leave iron break. Ready for lowering. Break up. Stand clear. Boats appear to be down. Prepare keel locks. One of the last steps is to lock the boat in place using the keel locks. Each boat has a forward and an aft keel lock that holds the boat in place against the chalk and prevents the boat from rocking back and forth as the ship does. Basically, the, that other lever, that's your tightener. The other level lever swings basically a hook. You want to hook that into the keel. All right, which way is going? Once it's been lashed back down, the boat is now fully stowed until it is needed again. The biggest difference is the winch. I think that was a lot of fun. I would hate to do it in the middle of the night, being cold and woken up and having to do about 20 of these, but it really gives you an example of how long it took to do each one. And also if you, as the ship is listening, if you want to manually do it, the amount of calculation that the officer commanding each end would have to do. Well, keep in mind, uh, we're in a situation where our lives don't depend on it. So imagine that these are two of them. We did one. And imagine you have 20, 22 lifeboats that you have to get out to sea in such a quick amount of time. It's definitely impressive knowing that despite the fact that these, at least today, are the infamous davits of the Titanic, they were still installed in this ship nearly 30 years later. And I will say... It is certainly a workout pulling them out. <laughs> and when we had them out and then over the edge and then you get to that point and then one thing I noticed when you look at, granted these are steel wires and Titanic was rope, but you kind of realize what you have to put your life in. Even if these were brand new, I'd be going, oh my, because we're only 30 feet above the water, you know, add a couple more stories to that and then when you get on a rope and a lifeboat like that, uh, even I knowing the story, I'm like, I don't know how much I trust that. You know, you got to appreciate these guys that night because I'm, I mean, we're, we're relatively lucky. I mean, it's still April, but over here in Muskegon, it's relatively warm. You know, it's not cold. It's, you know, we're, we're here working, you know, at nighttime, and, but it's, you can't help, but just wonder how, you know, under those, like how cold it would have been that night and just keeping focus and just getting this done. Looking over the edge at the inky black below was terrifying and I wasn't getting in the lifeboat. I was just looking over the edge to see what it was like. The idea that people were putting their life into the void that existed, being much higher up than we are here, is unimaginable. Swinging it out, we do all that work and it's hanging over there just as everyone's saying over the blackness. And you know, I was, I was kind of scared because it's hanging there over the water. It's like, what if these davits fail? What if the boat fails? But the next step is for me, all right, I, now I put Emma, Tommy, and Mark in, and now we lower our weights. Like, I, I can see the hesitancy there. Wow, that, that's the first time I think that really struck me, right there. I didn't even think about that, but just the idea that you're trusting, yeah. that you know you're like not, we stay you're back. not, you know, like, oh. Yeah, we stay back, like we're the men, we're, 
and the risk takers, but no, we put them in. You're putting the, the kids and the wife yes. into a boat in that inky blackness. Yeah. I can't, I, I didn't even think about that. No, that's true. I mean, just... I'd, I'd hate getting in it as is, like yeah. I'm putting some of my closest family members in. We're forced to sit back and just accept that, you know, we, we can't do anything. We have to just accept our faith. We might have a chance of getting off, but in most cases, most people realize like, this is it. This is our final goodbyes to our families, to our friends. I, I don't even know how they'd fathom it, thinking that they were gonna stay back on the nice, warm, yeah. lively musical ship and send them out into a small craft held up by ropes, 90 feet over the water. Well, let's take a step back also. You know, we're talking about Titanic, which was a graceful sinking until the end. What about all of the other ships, you know, where they swing the boat out and the boat fails and falls? Do you want where to it does it? happen? Well, think Empress, you have eight minutes of usable time roughly, and they got five of these on the older style on the list of 10 degrees or more. Well, now you see what I'm saying. Like I said in the live stream, those radials are much faster. For that situation, yeah. exact. Obviously, you have problems then of on the high side, yeah. it's a lot harder to do it. But like in that situation, you know, very specific. Not even to mention, I mean, we swung this pretty much all the way out and it would, it still looks like it'd be scraping the edge on the way down. If you even had a five degree list, I don't know if these boats would be functional on this ship. We're spending the night here aboard the Milwaukee Clipper and this is just one of the many adventures we're having to give us a better understanding of how these ships work and giving us a hands-on experience with history. The SS Milwaukee Clipper is a museum ship in Muskegon, Michigan. They have a great team of volunteers working to keep the ship afloat, but they could always use some extra hands. Our team stayed on board for four nights, helping to clean, paint, and do general maintenance throughout the vessel to help get the boat ready for the tourism season. So what I'm doing is I'm dry mopping the floor here. We just moved some furniture out of the way. Uh, maybe we'll get to mopping it, but we're at least just getting all of the easy to lift stuff off first. All right. I've just enlisted Eli to do the other side for me at the other end. Our team frequently works with museums and historical groups to produce our documentaries, and we like to stay in touch even after the release of these projects, continuing to help where we can, because keeping history alive really means something to us. The ship is tucked away in a hidden part of the city, often overlooked by tourists and hard to find even by the people who are looking for it. So we also spent a good amount of time producing promotional videos to help boost the ship's publicity. The Clipper was built in 1904 as the SS Juniata, and was rebuilt in the 1940s in its current Art Deco style. For the full story of this significant ship, check out our feature-length documentary on our channel titled SS Milwaukee Clipper, Queen of the Great Lakes. Thank you again to everybody with the crew of the Milwaukee Clipper in Muskegon, Michigan for hosting our team and letting us play around with their equipment. It was a lot of fun being on board and, and helping out, volunteering here and helping get the ship in shape for its tourism season this summer. And also getting an understanding of these and the instructions that the crew gave us on how to work. All of this historic equipment. A special thank you to my supporters on Patreon, especially Marlo Perez, Kelly Black, Kaiser Wilhelm II, Kaiser Friedrich III, Zach Richards, Donald Anderson, Cody Henricks, Joan Haynes, Sean Kimball, Glenn Bittescombe, Stephen Schwankert, Gabriel Colomb, RGB, Tara Molikar, Keith Holland, Rob M., Amos Mayhew, Corey Andrews, Nicholas Masella, Cole Tannock, Sophie Baber, Rob, Oliver Chinchen, John Maluski, David Watipka, Tiffany Raridan, Er, mm, Mad Time Media, Nathan Gutierrez, Max Metcalf, David Littlejohn, Sean Sahi Frazier, Nikki Chan 92, Corbin McDonald, Matthew Burns, Goblin of the Salt Plains, Luke Stevens, Gordon Robbins, Aaron Stark, Troy Wentworth, Clarky, Sam Forker, Busy B, Christopher Rosendale, Road Weary, Kitty Bits, Taniel 38, Kenzo Buick, Brian Reedy, Eden Cleefish, Bless Moles, Coda Yoda 16, Carol Adams, Clay Hobbs, Steve Valley, Gojira's Trains, J.C. Hobbs, High Treason, The Pepper Milk, Tristan White, Jason Stray, Chance Hudson, Robert Mayer III, Jordan Page, The Handler, Georgia Tsifa, Drew Shelton, 
Craven Moorhead, Jennifer and Sarah Vaughn, Ben Reese, Kenneth Hendricks, Aaron Prochaska, David Douglas, Alan and Modesta Charlone, Eric Castle, Lottie Cat, Jean Kennedy, and Pengu.